director. And um, just a reminder that this is being recorded, so we'll send the link out after, but we really appreciate you all being with us live. We'll start in just two minutes. Okay, all right, well, I have turned on my uh, video camera, or turned it back on, I should say, um, and so hopefully you all will see my face for just a moment, but um, the screen you're looking at, the, the presentation, um, will be sort of the focus as we go through this, but, but welcome, everyone. I hope you're seeing uh, my screen uh, and hearing us well. This is Tom Merrill. Until just recently, I was the committee director at the ACLC, and uh, supported uh, behind the scenes uh, this committee. And uh, so heard lots of great things about the conversations that took place and some of the um, uh, outputs that were produced and we'll review those real briefly and uh, then we'll jump into it. We have some uh, really impressive folks joining for today's conversation, including um, uh, uh, one of the organizations that uh, joined as a, a, a panelist. So let's jump in. And um, all right. So for those who are joining us that may not know us, the ACLC, the Accountable Care Learning Collaborative, real briefly, is an institution dedicated to advancing uh, value-based care. We do it in a number of ways. You can see here at the bottom, we try to help uh, provider leaders know what to do. Uh, when they should do it and how they can implement it. We convene folks um, primarily from uh, uh, the provider segment, but we also, as you can see here in our cool little um, symbol, uh, it's a multi-stakeholder uh, approach that uh, we use to uh, have these conversations. What you're seeing on your screen right now is our landmark resource that we refer to as the Accountable Care Atlas. It is sort of our guiding document that we use. Um, what you see on the screen are the 160 value-based care competencies that we identified back in um, 2017, I believe it was, and we use it to guide our research here uh, with you, our collaborative research with you, including um, the committee structure. So uh, the committee that we're looking at today represents one of those competencies that you see below in the health IT uh, sort of section, the green. And so uh, the goal of the ACLC is to uh, eventually have a committee that's built around each one of these competencies. And uh, we're about uh, 20, 20 in a lot of work uh, to go, but we're, uh, we have multiple committees. Um, real briefly, the committee process map shows you where we are, kind of how committees work. There are three months. We have pre-session interviews to prep for the first meeting. And um, then we have a second meeting a month or two later. Uh, and then uh, as you see now, we are wrapping up um, with a, a committee report out. We've already had the third meeting. Below you will see uh, a sense for the committees that have happened in this past year. So Q3 committees, Q4, Q1, and Q2. Uh, we will be wrapping up those Q2 committees next month uh, with a report out. So if those topics are relevant to your organization, uh, please plan on joining us and helping us spread the word because as you'll see, the information that comes out of these committees is just invaluable. So um, let's jump into this committee. So the Committee on Data Aggregation convened between January and May of this year. So uh, real troopers, 
Uh, all these folks stayed with us through the early stage of the pandemic and, and recognize that value-based care is as important as it's ever been, if not more important, because what we are realizing is that the organizations that have been engaging in value-based care were more prepared for this pandemic than others uh, for a variety of reasons that maybe will come out today. But let's uh, hear from, uh, let's look at our committee real briefly. So uh, these were the members. Um, of the committee, as you can see here, some very impressive individuals from some very impressive organizations. Um, we have with us today Sri from Franciscan Health. And so uh, as per our uh, approach to a committee report out, uh, we have we basically asked for volunteers from the committee who would be willing to sort of give us uh, the summary from the committee and some of the insights that they received and give us some guidance on what we, you know, they think that the ACLC and the really the industry at large should be looking uh, forward as we move forward in this work. So, um, but uh, we would be remiss if we didn't um, uh, uh, call out our sponsors. So we had Innovacer, uh, CVP, and InterSystems, um, and we really appreciate their generous support in making this committee um, available to both uh, the members of the ACLC and also guest members, which really kind of brings the group together and allows, you know, different perspective, different markets um, to kind of really enrich the conversation and ensure that these um, uh, resources that are provided are just as relevant as possible. We also had a supporting sponsor in Arcadia, and um, we won't have one of the representatives join today, but wanted to give them a shout out. Um, sharp folks, and just as you can see, this group has a lot of smart folks. We had the uh, representatives from these three organizations join the committee and very substantively contribute to the outputs that you're about to see. And we'll hear from them at the end of the, um, uh, toward the end of today's uh, report. So let's move on, and uh, I will preview the competency framework. Uh, competency framework is a fancy way of saying how did they break down this topic? So the topic is, or the competency is, aligning data aggregation efforts um, with a value-based care strategy. And as any of you know that are involved in this, that's a lot, right? We could meet for multiple years uh, weekly and still not get all the way through it. So if you have to just meet for three months, how do you break that down? This is how they broke that down. This competency framework, uh, the goal is to make the topic more approachable for health leaders, but also give them a guide if they want to dive deeper. So um, the three that you're seeing here will be included in an output called the Competency Orientation Guide, or COG as we call it for short. That will be made available shortly on our website, and that's one of the two publications that will come out of this committee. So you see that there on the left. We also produce these just really relevant, um, also two page documents called a case study brief. And it is what it sounds like. It's a brief case study. We, we really limit ourselves to two pages on both these documents, uh, which is hard because for those of you who are part of the committees, a lot of information comes out of these committees. We force ourselves to just squeeze it into the shortest possible document. Um, and the organization that was selected to be the subject of this case study brief was Lehigh Valley, um, who has just had a lot of, done a lot of really impressive things in this realm and had some really great results. Um, that'll also be forthcoming. Uh, go to our website and um, uh, take advantage of these important resources. So without any further ado, let's jump into our conversation uh, with, with Sri who is our representative from the committee. And uh, while on the committee was at UC uh, um, Irvine, uh, but has since made the transition to Franciscan Health. So from the West Coast to the Eastern time zone and uh, welcome Sri, uh, I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna ask Sri to briefly introduce himself and his organization. And then I have some important questions for Sri. So this is uh, Sri Bharadwaj, uh, Vice President, uh, Digital Innovation and Applications um, for Franciscan Health. Franciscan Health is a 14-hospital system based out of uh, uh, Indianapolis, Illinois, and Michigan. Um, 
over a few hundred uh, clinics uh, supporting the hospitals and several um, uh, skilled nursing facilities and home health capabilities. So kind of your typical standard IDN uh, based out of the Midwest, I would call it. Um, that is uh, that, and the best thing that could have ever happened was uh, I shouldn't say best thing, but uh, from a from a you know for selfishly from an innovation perspective, you innovate when there are challenges that you're trying to meet, and uh, innovation has been at the forefront for what we've been doing, uh, particularly when it comes to virtual health in a pandemic. Um, so that has been very very useful uh, to move the agenda. In a in a in an organization that has not uh, that has not considered uh, virtual care as a core component component or competency, so now uh, that is becoming a core component competency of the organization. So good to good to um, see that that's happening not just for us but for across the across the industry. Um, going backwards with UC Irvine Health, a lot of work with the uh, the Learning Care Collaborative. Uh, the, the aggregation aspect of data is something we'll talk about in detail, but I really would like to uh, thank um, our friends uh, for putting this together, a uh, very, very involved group uh, that uh, generated a, uh, what do you call, um, a competency orientation guide uh, that will talk about a framework that we can be used for uh, acquisition, assimilation, storage, and uh, applying insight to data. Great. Well, thank you, Sri, and uh, we absolutely appreciated your involvement. Would you mind telling us what data aggregation? Um, I think these are. Um, oh, okay. Sorry, the question was a little bit different in my mind. It's been a moment. So, can you just uh, describe how uh, your organization uses data aggregation to further or support value-based care? So, we have an ACO, and we use the data. Uh, for, for, you know, at risk patient population for an ACO, no doubt. Uh, but taking a step back, I think, you know, 95%, 90% of the healthcare data is outside healthcare, right? As we've seen, we heard this a few times um, uh, from the Geisinger leadership teams. So um, when I look at that and when I look at where we are today, um, the the core component for us is to make sure that we get the right data from the right source systems in order to make the right decisions or provide the right insights so the decision makers, meaning the physicians, have the right data in their fingertips as actionable insights. And I think that is a core component that we are striving to achieve. Uh, we are not there yet for sure. Uh, we're getting there, but we'll, we'll, we are trying to figure out um, how do we take data aggregation, meaning data from various sources, uh, put it together and then make sure it all works together. One of the biggest challenges that we have uh, is uh, we would like data around um, the other aspects of healthcare that impact healthcare, like social determinants of health. Uh, and that data um, is always difficult to come by, or even if you have it from social, um, you know, social so so sources. It is very difficult to put it all together, make sure it is, is mapped appropriately and built into the EHRs. Um, there's also some reluctancy on top of the uh, patients to provide some of this data as well, until unless um, there is a, a requirement for them to provide the data in some way, shape, or form. So uh, all of these things um, provide us, give us some challenges in getting the data, right data compiled and also to make sure that you know we can improve quality, reduce cost, uh, increase access, and improve the caregiver experience. Right. The last part is the most important part. How do we improve the caregiver experience in terms of making sure the physicians and the care team have the right data from the patient about the patient with the, that can be shared with the patient at the time the care is happening? I think that is the biggest concern we have today, and that concern is something that we are trying to mitigate. Great, thank you, Sri. Next question. Um, we know you covered a lot in the committees, uh, so this one's kind of a, a toughie. But we ask you to, if you had to limit it to one thing, what's the what's the greatest takeaway that you took from your committee discussions? So uh, I don't know if uh, the audience needs to understand that this is not a unique 
challenge just for one organization. That's one thing we realized. Um, almost all of the organizations that we met together have, have similar challenges or difficulties that we've been through. Uh, and uh, for me, I think uh, quality of data um, is, is probably one of the more pressing issues. Uh, you know, you could get an enterprise master patient index, uh, you know, and do deduplication of data and so on and so forth. But um, how do you take that data and how do you make sure the quality is there? Um, and uh, not just the quality is there, but is the, is the data that's coming from an EMR uh, not, uh, you know, it's not, it's many respects, it's not structured data that you can just take, take and assimilate and analyze. It's mostly unstructured data and it's mostly in notes and other uh, other ways that physicians document what the, phys what the physician sees at that point in time. So for me, uh, it was a good way to understand that uh, there is a pathway, there is a progress, there is capabilities, uh, and it's it's not just us. Great, uh, a very important insight. Okay, last last question. Um, what data aggregation strategies are you looking at going forward? Give a, give us a peek into the work that is to come at your new organization. So uh, one of the reasons why I got hired was to develop a care connected platform that will bring in data uh, from several um, several sources, right? That is the, one of the key aspects that I'm I'm looking at, right? Um, the you know there is a level there's a need for an EMPI or a or enterprise patient uh, master patient index that will house all of the information. However, uh, there is always this what do you call consent, uh, which becomes a big conversation when it comes to patients. And you know, are they truly giving consent for the right information or are they struggling with that consent process? That is a big question. And the second question is how they would like to be communicated with. Uh, you know, that's, a, that's another factor. On what instances can they be communicated with? And at what times can they communicate with? To whom? Uh, you know, the, all of those factors uh, are, are important things that, uh, um, that things that we need to, we need to figure out. As well, so that is one aspect of it. Then you, you, as you move towards, you know, understanding uh, the data and providing uh, some level of um, AI associated with, you know, doing the analysis and understanding what the data seems like for a specific set of population with uh, with similar comorbidities, we got to take a look at how do we bring that care coordination into the picture, care care coordination, case management, uh, whatever we might want to call it. And then interventions, right? How do we bring in the right interventions for the various uh, uh, diagnoses or um, or various um, uh, impacts that the, the could have on patients uh, due to their um, current healthcare state? That is something that we we strive for looking at. And then for us, it's about bringing in that engagement aspect of it. How do we bring the right level of engagement between the patient, the caregiver, the care team? And of course, the entire um, healthcare uh, spectrum of activity that they go through. Uh, a lot of patients, for example, go through physiotherapy for a, in a local, uh, you know, fitness club or whatever. And that data never reaches us till such time we connect the fitness club data into our environment, right? So that is a kind of angle that we look at and create a a framework that will bring in all data together and then deliver that data in a way. Um, and I shouldn't say deliver, um, apply analytics over that data that you can get to and then provide insight to the physicians and clinicians. That is the whole purpose of doing this. Yeah. Well, incredibly important um, competencies, and I'm sure you'll get all that done in your first year there, right? Yes, yes. It's already <laughs> behind the book, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, Sri. We really uh, appreciate your contribute, your outsized contribution to this committee, and we will um, very much uh, in, enjoy observing you in your new position, and and uh, are excited for all the good things to come at Franciscan. Thank you. All right. Well, um, okay. Well, let's pivot now. Uh, we'll keep we'll keep Sri on. Um, I didn't do a. a I wanted to give everyone a heads up that we will take our last 10 minutes 
to uh, take any questions from the audience. Uh, but right now what we want to do is pivot to our sponsors and allow them to give a message um, to the broader uh, ACLC audience and the public that we've, we invite in these report outs. But we will preserve 10 minutes. Um, so be thinking about the questions that you have for Sri or the sponsors themselves. So uh, all are mentally prepared to be in the hot seat. So we are going to start with Kirthi, who is joining us from uh, CVP. And uh, we're asking uh, our sponsors to just tell us about themselves, uh, their organization, obviously, and then um, why they chose to, to sponsor the committee. So Kirthi, are you there still? Hi, good afternoon. I hope everybody can hear me. And uh, I'm Kirthi Anantaram. I'm our Vice President for Corporate Strategy and Growth here at uh, Customer Value Partners. And I do want to first off thank uh, ACLC and all of our panelists for the opportunity to sponsor this committee, number one, and really serve alongside in some rich discussions um, over the past few months. Uh, it's really been a, a great experience. Uh, customer value partner, CBP. Uh, we are a leading technology and healthcare solutions provider, uh, serving large healthcare clients within the federal market sp space, primarily CMS, HHS, Veterans Affairs, and Defense Health Agency. Uh, through our work specifically with CMS, uh, we are very closely involved in servicing a variety of their data insights and research needs uh, related to new models of care and also uh, measurement of clinical quality within both the Medicare and uh, Medicaid domains. Uh, so obviously, given our expertise in these uh, core healthcare areas, uh, sponsoring this committee was sort of a, a no-brainer for us. Uh, first, primarily with the intent to hear directly from the panelists and uh, people on the front lines and what their needs are. Um, and then more importantly, uh, that would in turn turn around and feed our um, internal uh, desire and uh, investments to refine our solutions and products that can better align with the market needs. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kirthi. We really appreciated having uh, your organization as a sponsor, and uh, we hope very much that this will help help inform the good work that you're doing. And and um, we love being able to get folks together and and having uh, that provider voice amplified. So love hearing that, thank you. Let's, um, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I didn't show uh, your slide, uh, but it also is a great prompt for, uh, or a reminder that we will send this uh, deck out in the follow-up to this meeting and you'll also have the video. So um, no. obviously some, some good insights here. No, definitely, thank you, Tom. And, and I'll be very brief about this. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, obviously we'll publish out um, as part of the COG, you'll, you'll notice that uh, uh, it, there are two important aspects to the study that we did, uh, which is storing data effectively and securing for optimal call and pull, and then really applying the data insights to improve care delivery and reducing costs. Uh, when we work with several of our large healthcare clients, uh, their challenges are no different from ACOs and other providers and uh, even payers to a large extent uh, in terms of challenges very specific to data aggregation. Uh, when it comes to data aggregation, there's always this question of where do we find the right investment to uh, really make our infrastructure both effective and efficient so we can then turn around, use some of those savings, and then handle some of the more tough challenges. So. Uh, as we work with clients in our consulting capacity, we, uh, we almost always advise them in terms of first lowering their total cost of ownership in terms of their infrastructure and their and how they handle the data and how they handle their compute. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, all IT, despite the fact that it's all just enable, enablement technology, uh, is, is not only a big spend, uh, but it can also be a big source of savings. So, so things like migrating to the cloud, adopting open source software, meaning securely adopting open source software, optimizing your, your uh, uh, footprint in the cloud. Uh, also thinking about uh, securely uh, purchasing you know, managed software as a service, which today uh, is very readily available. Uh, those are things we talk to clients about, we advise them on. And last but not least, you know, the more you can automate, the, the more you can find savings to repurpose into uh, other areas. So uh, 
before we, without further ado, I just wanted to uh, quickly talk about the CVP Nightingale. If anybody's interested, we can uh, give you a, a quick view of the managed SaaS offering that we have that really serves all these needs. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, and uh, Kirthi, we uh, really appreciated the insights that came from an obvious uh, place of, of application. So um, uh, please reach out to us if you have additional questions, if you have questions for Kirthi and we'll, we will connect you. Um, let us move on right now to Linda Rowe from, from Inner Systems. Linda, can you, you still have audio? I do. So right, thank you everyone. Ahead. I'm Linda Rowe. I'm Senior Advisor Value Based Markets at InterSystems. Uh, we are a technology company, a software technology company, but we have long and deep roots in uh, the healthcare industry. First, again, I want to thank all of the participants on this committee. It's been great to have an interactive and uh, engaging dialogue over the course of the last few months. Uh, so we're really happy that we are able to sponsor it. Uh, we have our uh, built our own, uh, what we call unified care record data aggregation platform that we sell across multiple markets. So one of the reasons we sponsored this is because, again, we're always interested to hear what folks are doing, what their needs are, what the gaps are, uh, and where people are having challenges. And I think one of the things I like about this committee is that people talk about sort of the operational and tactical challenges, because I think that technology is only a small fraction of what really needs to happen to make things come to life when it comes to bringing data together and making that happen. So I think one of my big key takeaways during the course of the conversation, I think there were two. The first one was just the whole discussion we had, I think at the last meeting around governance. Um, and the fact that data governance and sort of stakeholder buy-in about what's the value, what's the purpose of the data, how's it going to be used, who has access to that data, I think that was an incredibly important part because, again, as, as those of you who may be embarking on this journey or have embarked on this journey, um, you're not successful no matter what you do with your technology partners if you don't have really good structure and governance around it. I think the second thing that I thought was um, really important was sort of having, we talked about clean data, and that's something we talk a lot about with our customers uh, today, is the fact that the data that comes out of so many different systems, whether it's out of a claim system, out of an EHR, and social determinants aren't even well-defined in terms of their structure or how <laughs> you would store them or how you would use them. So if you think about the fact that, that You've got great data assets, but if they're not usable, they're not coherent, they're not connected, they're not clean, then that makes it really challenging um, to really find value and action out of that data. So those were kind of my takeaways. Awesome. All right, well, thank you, Linda. I, I'm realizing uh, I neglected to move the slides forward. Is, right. Should I be on this slide right now? Yeah, and so again, this just echoes what, what we have observed, right? Is that we are just, the real world challenges have to do with so many different data types, right? That live in different places. And if you think, uh, 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 we call it Marla in the middle there is the patient, all the different information that lives outside of that traditional healthcare system. The problem is today we have disparate sources, but it's all in different formats. There's data missing, so often what you get is incomplete, and we have so many standards. So it really makes it very challenging for healthcare organizations. And again, I, I agree with the, the previous speaker um, that we work with payers, we pr work with, with uh, provider organizations, we work with ACOs. They all have this same unique challenge, right, of getting that really good data. So, and then, I think I just have one more quick slide. So again, one of the things I'm really good at is understanding a process. Uh, and we talked about a lot of, about this process actually as part of this committee, but how do you get to good clean data? And again, it's the acquisition, the validation, the unification of that deduplication using an EMPI to make sure you've got the data around the same patient, but then 
you know, once you've got that really good clean data, the nice thing is that the uh, you have multiple ways that that can be applied, right? It can be through analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, care processes, quality measurement. So again, we just feel it's so foundational. And I think one of the things in the guide is we it talks about People understand what you leave. my co-sponsors, our panelists for this really great dialogue that we've been able to have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Linda. And um, we very much appreciate having had inner systems uh, at the table, giving guidance based on all the great work that they've done. Um, so th thank you, Linda. I think now um, I'm not sure if we were able to get David's audio. Are, David, are you there? I sure am. Awesome. Welcome, David. So, so David Nace from Innovacer um, uh, has been with the ACLC for a while now and was, uh, um, I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself, David, but from our standpoint, was a no-brainer and being a, a sponsor for this uh, committee as well. So let me turn it over to you, David. No, that's great. And thanks, Tom. You know, I just got off a webinar with my friend David Nash for 30 years now, we keep remembering at School of Population Health at Jefferson, the founder of the first school in this country of population health. And we just had an awesome webinar with a, a colleague of ours who graduated from the Jefferson program, uh, just to talk about this issue of data. And, you know, we've talked for 20, 25 years about how data should be the basis of everything we do. And we experienced that in so many other industries, right? Banking and um, retail with Amazon and search with Google and transportation with Uber. And we don't do that in healthcare. Um, so the work that this committee has been doing is just so important. And it's a, it's a key linchpin within all the other work that ACL, ACLC has been doing across its committees. I mean, we know that if we truly learn to use data, as we have in other industries, we can address these healthcare challenges we're so fraught with that have been brought to light in this pandemic? How do we reduce the cost of care? How do we increase quality? And how do we engage people, not just patients, but people in the community and across health systems and public health? So today, and I think Sri really brought it up, illustrated it so nicely, that we have disconnected data. It exists in silos, even within our own organizations. I think Sri pointed out 90 to 95% of the data that's going to be pertinent lies not only outside our healthcare system or practice, but outside the healthcare system in general. What we now know is the social determinants of health. And nothing um, really in the past is really brought to bear to really bring all this data forward the way I went on Amazon this morning and purchased something and it was tied into supply chain. I can track it and it knows my preferences and I can return it, which I really like. But the idea of creating a unified patient record from all of these sources to allow the continuum of care to really you know, address real-time high quality care and handle community resilience to address issues like this pandemic is phenomenal. So this, the work of this committee has been so important. And I think the, the final interoperability rules are gonna be a challenge for many organizations. So, <clears throat> um, you know, what got me interested in coming to Silicon Valley uh, to be a part of Innovacer is, you know, our, what we do is we use machine learning and um, artificial intelligence to create a healthcare data platform. The same thing that Salesforce did or Uber, Lyft, et cetera, to be able to streamline that information, coordinate care, bringing it together for everybody and then activating that data to allow all the members of the healthcare system to care as one. So, you know, we have really promoted exactly right here, and thanks for pulling this slide up. This is what we call the connected care framework. If we can in real time bring data in, paid claims, real time, community-based, social determinants of health, and really activate that data by ensuring high quality of data in a unified patient record, and then providing the ability for people to innovate and build their own applications, or us to stand them up and learn along the way, to give insights to the various people that need it, doctors within whatever EMR they're using, care coordinators in their system uh, for patients, because we all have a smartphone, uh, people that are 
trying to implement these programs and do good analytics to manage good populations and new contracts by streaming rich analytics to these stakeholders and customizing the insights and giving them just what they need to know as an actionable insight in their work stream or in their life stream as, as a patient. I know I'm taking Uber to the dentist. I wanna know if for some reason my appointment's been canceled. Uh, so being able to give real time decision support to the stakeholders, the right data, right sources and make that actionable. I mean, that's what uh, I think is the dream we're trying to accomplish with so many other other stakeholders as we've had at this table and that sponsored this committee. So uh, it's been great to be a part of it. And uh, thanks to all the other sponsors. Thanks for all the committee members. And uh, Sri, thanks for tying it all together here in this final presentation. Awesome, thank you, David. Well, as, as you can all hear, for those of you that weren't a part of this committee, it included just a lot of really dynamic folks um, with a lot of energy and enthusiasm for such an important topic. Let us move to the uh, question and answer for just the last few minutes. I think we've got about five minutes left. And I'm seeing that we do have at least one question. Let me go to it. This is from uh, Tim Callahan and he asks uh, or makes the comment, uh, public health agencies struggle with aggregating new birth data and initial immunizations. This is typically related to data collection and data entry issues, especially when parents delay naming kids. What insights do you have for addressing these issues? So maybe we can start with, uh, um, well, actually, I'll just, I'll open up that question. Who has a thought on this? We went straight for the public health. This is the hardest one. Thank you, Tim. Well, I'm happy to tackle that. Um, I'm going to actually broaden it a little bit. <clears throat> so this is Dr. Nate. So, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we look at as a data platform, so go back to that example I brought about Amazon. It's connected with all these partners, right? All these different data sources, retail, et cetera. You can see when your package is coming, I actually have one due today. <laughs> so, and I know exactly when it will be arriving. So uh, a, a data platform like these other industries have used and, and that we brought to healthcare allows you to connect with multiple partners. So I'll give you an example. Progeny is a great example of a home-based um, pregnancy monitoring you know, tool. So you don't have to come to the clinic and you can monitor high-risk pregnancy and start working with answering questions and connect with uh, your team uh, in real time. Now, if you're in a socially disadvantaged area with a social vulnerability index that's really high and risk score, and you have barriers to transportation or need for a community agency to connect to, that's another connection point that gets brought in. And it, it's the patient that gets to the live decide who are the partners that really should connect with them. So they can, wherever they are, connect with those and bring together those resources and collaborate with the health, with the health system as well. So we use Aunt Bertha as a, as a legacy source of community resources. We use other partners to connect with those sources to allow us closed loop communication and involve them when the patient decides they want them as part of that care. And we use partners uh, you know, that can bring in real-time data streams from monitoring devices, say if you're high risk in pregnancy or post-delivery, helping to make decisions that make sense with your, with your obstetrician, with your whoever you've choose, chosen to use with your, your birthing process and then in your early child care with your pediatrician. So it's all about caring as one and bringing that team together. So this is Sri, I, I represent public health on the Health Sector Council, which is a public-private partnership between CMS, HHS, and uh, ASPER. Um, we have several folks from the healthcare sector who represent various aspects of health healthcare and um, meet together on an ongoing basis as a committee. And we have several work, work groups that deal with the various things. Um, this aspect has been discussed in, in several areas. Um, the, the concern is not about um, uh, the uh, ability to aggregate new birth data and initial immunization. I think it, the concern is how do we take this data and make it available in such a way that makes sense? That's one. The second thing is how do we assimilate this data in a way that really uh, can be utilized by other, um, both the providers and payers, in whatever way you want to take a look at it. And uh, how much of this data uh, is really being gathered today in a very structured format by the public health agencies too. So 
there are several aspects to this that uh, need to be understood. Um, it's not just uh, us, and, you know, having conversations with several agencies have told us that all of them are all struggling uh, to try to figure out just like this sector, or I shouldn't say sector, the industry itself is struggling with the same process. So we will come together better. Um, we are in various respects doing that. Um, this is another aspect that's being tackled. and It'll take some time for us to get there. Yeah, that's a great point, Sri. And, you know, the accountable communities of health is a great model that started to move in this direction as well. So I also wanted to comment that, uh, this is Linda, that, you know, some of our customers, our HIEs customers, um, have really partnered with public health and they use alerting systems to look for both uh, events that public health wants to know about, as well as gaps uh, of missing data that they need to feed to their public health. So they're part of the fabric uh, of the entire community. So they don't just connect provider organizations, they connect uh, the local social organizations and support organizations, post-acute care, but public health is also part of that whole partnership model. And again, I think part of it is once you create the data fabric across your community, you start seeing data liquidity in a way that starts to help solve for some of those problems. Great. Well, well, thank you all for, for answering that question and, and Tim for a fantastic question. Um, we absolutely believe this, that value-based care is, is, um, is elevating the issue of the increasing overlap between value-based care or sorry, the health system and public health. And, um, you know, the public health should be a great partner here. All right. Well, we are at time. I just want to uh, thank, give a final thank you to uh, Sri for being our uh, committee panelist uh, representative here, um, but absolutely our fantastic sponsors, um, uh, Kirthi, Linda, and David, and uh, for joining us and, and sharing their insights. Everyone uh, else that's joined us, please look forward to the publications that these folks contributed to, and uh, we will join you um, uh, in our next uh, uh, committees. So, so thank you all, and uh, we will talk soon. Bye, everybody.